Let me get started and share screen. All right, can you see it? Okay, good. So let's follow up on what we were talking about last time when my computer uh, really uh, uh, slowed down to a crawl. And what happened was that the power management doesn't seem to be working. So it wasn't charging, it was losing juice, and then the basically stopped working. So now I made sure that at least it's charged, even though I haven't gotten the root of the problem, but at least I know how to avoid the problem. So hopefully nothing bad would happen today. Okay, so we constructed uh, the QFD in sort of a heuristic fashion, starting from a harmonic oscillator at every position in space. And we came up with the Lagrangian at the end of the day. But now we would like to do a top-down approach. Suppose you are given this Lagrangian, what do you get? And of course, I'd like to make sure that the both directions meet in the middle. Uh, so that's the idea of the discussion that I started last Friday. And you may also ask the question, why is this Lagrangian uh, something we have to take seriously as a starting point? And I tell you a little bit of an answer, part of the answer later on. And so just wait for the second that we do start with this Lagrangian for now and see what we get. And what we talked about is the fact that once you're given the Lagrangian, you can derive the canonical commutation relation. So that's an advantage over Hamiltonian where you have to accept the uh, canonical commutation relation on, on the side of the Hamiltonian uh, Lagrangian knows that too. So there's nothing uh, that you cannot derive out of it. So once you're given this Lagrangian, you derive this canonical commutation relation and you also derive this Hamiltonian. So everything comes from this Lagrangian. So in that sense, we are talking about this top-down approach. And given that the canonical commutation relation uh, is the same thing as the annihilation creation operator for harmonic oscillator, we know how to define the vacuum state that's annihilated by the annihilation operator at every position in space, X. Then we can start building the Hilbert space by acting the creation operator on the vacuum state from one particle, two particle, three particle states, and so on and so forth. So for an arbitrary n body state, can always be written this way. So you will first create n particles by using creation operator on the vacuum state. And you take a linear superposition of these basically position eigenstates to define an arbitrary state capital of psi. And the number operator is given by the sum of the number operator at every position. And sum in this case is actually an integral of a space because we are now dealing with a continuum space. So that's the, the starting point. And then we can make sure that the one particle state by uh, acting one creation operator on the vacuum state is indeed an eigenstate of this number operator with the eigenvalue one. And therefore uh, any one particle state can be written as a linear superposition of these uh, uh, one particle states at position X. And the weight function is given by this capital Psi of X and T. And what we verified so far is that if you look at the time evolution of this state, and this coefficient function capital psi end up satisfying the uh, one particle Schrodinger equation. So time evolution of any state is given by this Schrodinger equation, namely the Hamiltonian operator is that pushes the time forward infinitesimally. And so that's the meaning of this Schrodinger equation. And for the left-hand side of the equation, the only thing that depends on time is this coefficient function capital of psi. So that's where the time derivative acts on. On the right-hand side of the equation, you have to literally act this Hamiltonian operator on the state you are given here. And after some algebra, you find this expression and you find that time derivative of this coefficient function capital of psi is given by basically p squared over 2m plus v. But this is in a position representation. So p squared is given by h bar squared and derivative squared with minus sign. And that's indeed the Schrodinger equation you're familiar with for a point particle in external potential v. So now we see that this QFT from top down approach really reproduces the quantum mechanics for one particle uh, state. So that's one thing we have already verified. And then we went on to study the two particle state. So you use two creation operators. And the first thing you verify is that indeed this state is an eigenstate of the number operator with the eigenvalue two. So it is indeed a two particle state. 
An arbitrary two-particle state is, can be written as a linear superposition of these localized two-particle states. But one thing we see right away is that this coefficient function is automatically symmetrized. So the symmetry of the both statistics of identical particles is already built into the formulation, which is already a one step better than the standard quantum mechanics where you have to impose the symmetry of the wave function by hand. So that's something what we already discussed. And then we looked at the other, again, time evolution and doing following through the same process. And that's exactly what you're doing with the homework problem right now. Then you recover the two body, uh, the Schrodinger equation. So to, to just give you a little bit of a hint on how you might actually go about doing so. So it is easier to do it by rewriting this first term that involves derivatives using integration by parts, as usual, we're dropping the boundary terms, either assuming it's infinity of space or it is a periodic boundary condition, either way is fine. And by acting this second derivative using integration by parts, let it act on psi dagger with a minus sign over here. This is useful because the first two terms then can be combined by factoring out this psi as a common factor on the right. So that's why doing integration by parts is a useful thing to simplify the rest of the algebra. So now that the first two terms have the common factor of psi acting on the rest of this state, I can use the commutation relation repeatedly to move psi of y, hopping over psi dagger of x1 and hopping over psi dagger of x2. Each time you hop, you get this commutator. First time you get the delta one minus x1, and second time you get delta one minus x2. And at the end of the day, psi of y is acting directly on the vacuum state, which vanishes by definition. So that's how you get this expression uh, by, uh, from, from this Hamiltonian. In the last term, which has this uh, the lambda piece with psi dagger, psi dagger, psi, psi, I have two psi's which need to be hopped over to the, 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 right, the right and act directly on the vacuum state. So I need to hop each of these psi's over these either of these psi daggers. So one of them pr produces delta y minus x1, the other one produces delta y minus x2, but you have a choice whether this first psi chooses x1 or second psi chooses x1, hence there's a factor of two that cancels this factor of a half, so you end up with just lambda without a half to half. So that's how you get the second piece over here. And one of you asked the questions of Piazza, how you actually use this delta function to rewrite the piece in a form we want. So at the end of the day, I have delta function between x1 and x2 after performing the y integral. So the idea is that when you perform y integral, using first delta function, you can replace y anywhere by x1. So this y then replaced by x1, and that's a delta function that remains here. But then some of you ask the question, how come that there's still x1 and x2 over here when you integrate this and replace y by uh, 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 x1? That's what I did here. So when you replace y by x1, you get psi dagger x1, psi dagger x1. That's different from the initial state we started, psi dagger x1, psi dagger x2. But this delta function forces x1 and x2 to be the same anywhere. So it is okay to replace second x1 to x2 to bring it back to the form we started. So that's why I'm allowed to take this into the form of the uh, uh, expression common to all terms now with psi dagger of x1 and psi dagger of x2. And then you equate both sides of the equation and that's indeed the two particle Schrodinger equation. And what's different from the one body case is this self interaction. So both particles have this kinetic energy terms, p squared of 2m, with the same mass m because they are identical particles. They both move in the same external potential v, but there's also interaction between them given by this delta function repulsive potential. So now the two particle state, again, reproduces 
the standard two particle Schrodinger equation. So QFT, uh, the quantum mechanics can derive out of QFT. So the, namely QFT is more powerful because it contains states with all uh, the number of particles, not just one, two, or any number of particles. And then you can recover the standard Schrodinger equation, now including interaction. So that's pretty much where I stop on Friday. So let me pause here to see if you have any questions on what I just briefly reviewed what we discussed on Friday before the crash. Everything okay? I hope you see this idea that we built up QFD, but now we are deriving quantum mechanics from QFD. So we're going the other direction. And then you see that uh, the two particle Schrodinger equation had been correctly reproduced. But one of you asked the question, I don't know who that was now, uh, how come that we only get this delta function interaction? Can the particles be interacting with some long range potential like Coulomb potential? And, and that's the discussion I started on Friday, but couldn't finish because of the crash. And that's what comes up uh, on the next slides. Uh, but any questions about this at this moment? Is everything okay? Um, I have a question, not directly ahead, related to this, but just- That's fine. Um, so, I mean, when we drop the boundary terms, uh, can we still do that if we're dealing with a bound particle or a bound state? Uh, you could. In the case of the bound particles, then all the wave functions will damp exponentially at the infinity. So the boundary term at the spatial infinity is always zero from the nature of being bound. So that's another way of actually allowing for boundary terms to be uh, always dropped, namely to put the system in a potential well. So that's yet another way of doing it beyond periodic boundary condition, or just assuming that physics is local, everything vanishes at boundary. Now the potential forces all the states to vanish at the boundaries. So then you are completely justified to drop the boundary terms. So that's a very good question, Shirak, and thank you for asking that question. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so if you have any further questions, we can always come back to this, but let me just uh, keep going. So we also briefly talked about three particle state, the same idea when you use three creation operators, you get an eigenstate of the number operator with the eigenvalue three. So that's indeed a three particle state. General state can be written as a linear superposition. And we go through the same exercise of working out the time evolution of this coefficient function capital psi using this Hamiltonian. And that leads to, again, the, the standard three-body Schrodinger equation. Now with three kinetic terms for three particles, three potential terms for three particles, each potential is experienced at the position of the particle x1, x2, and x3. Then I have this repulsive potential, but I do correctly get three terms for it because there's always three pairs for each of the pair, we get this delta function potential. So this is the way you correctly describe the three particles interacting for each pair by this two body repulsion when they come close to each other. So once again, we can derive quantum mechanics out of QFT. And so going from this uh, the, uh, the, the line into the last line is a pretty lengthy algebra but nonetheless, you can go through this. It's straightforward. There's no ambiguity in it. And, and then you do recover the three particle multi-body quantum mechanics out of the QFT Lagrangian we started. So let me stop here again uh, to see if there are any questions. Okay, I guess not. It's the same idea. So conceptually, I'm not adding anything new. So this is where I couldn't finish. So suppose you have some long range interaction among the particles in your system. For example, you have a helium atom and both electrons, you have two electrons in helium, both electrons are living in the common Coulomb potential coming from the helium nucleus, but two electrons would repel each other also by a Coulomb potential. So that's a situation you also want to describe by having a long range potential between two particles. And that is achieved by this term in Hamiltonian. And, and so this term is rather intuitive if you think about it. So if you take this piece, which has psi at y2 and psi dagger at y2, that is the number operator 
at possession y2 uh, in terms of actually the, what, how many particles you got at possession y2. And this is, of course, meant to be integrated rather than summed on a convenient space. So psi dag of psi uh, has a meaning of the charge density. So this is the number density of the particle at position y2. And if you have this long range potential between position x and y, this is the density at position y that interacts with the particle, also with the density of position x. So the potential energy is then given by the integral of this potential energy with the source of potential at y, which is the experienced potential at the position x. And that's this integral. So here I'm switching notation from x, y to y1, y2, but that's the only difference. The only thing you might wonder is this fact of a half. When you have this potential energy between two particles, you really would like to count the potential energy for each pair of the particles. So if you consider y to be the source and the potential is expressed by x, you count it once. If you consider x to be the source of the potential that's experienced by particle y, you count the potential now twice. So you're doing double counting. That's why you need to put a factor of a half here. And that's what you do in classical medium too. So if you have a charged medium, like a fluid, and if you like to compute the Coulomb self energy of the medium, you again put in a factor of a half with a Coulomb potential with the density of the medium, a position y1 and y2. So that's exactly the same idea over here. So this is the way you can describe the any long range interaction among particles in your system. And of course, what we like to do is go through the same exercise. You consider an arbitrary n body state. Then you look at the time evolution of this coefficient function capital of psi. And if you work it out, you find this expression namely that for each particle, you add the kinetic energy and external potential piece. But for every pair of particles, namely I is less than J, for every pair of particles, you include this interaction potential. And that's exactly the right Hamiltonian for the multi-body uh, uh, Schrodinger equation when you have the long range interaction between particles at position X, Y, and X, J. So once again, you can reproduce the multi-particle quantum mechanics of n identical particles living in external potential v x, but also interacting among each other with the potential v int. So you can correctly describe external potential and internal potential for this multi-particle system. So once again, we are reproducing n particle quantum mechanics with external potential and inter internal interaction out from the quantum field theory. So you can see that quantum field theory has exactly the same physics content to the multi-particle quantum mechanics, but now with the automatic symmetrization, and you have a big pop space of Hilbert spaces, each with its own number of particles, but Hilbert space with particle zero, particle one, particle two, and so on and so forth, so forth. All of these Hilbert spaces are included in a big Hilbert space called the Fox space of quantum field theory. So that's the idea how QFT reproduces everything we know about the quantum mechanics uh, uh, we have studied in 137. Okay, so this is where I stop because this is start starting a new material today. And I'm sure there are some questions about this. Higher up, don't be shy. Is everything clear? Okay, so I hope this satisfies. Uh, okay, go ahead. Who is it? Uh, I'm sorry, it's Mashid. Um, can you explain what your what the step is that you're doing in in how you get from the first line to the second? Could you just yeah. re-explain that first? I'd appreciate yeah, that. so I, I'm not showing a derivation here, but I'm applying the same idea I use for the two particle and three particle states. Namely that the Schrodinger equation is that time derivative of this state times IH bar is given by this whole Hamiltonian acting on the state. 
And time derivative of the state is simply time derivative of this coefficient function because we're using a Schrodinger picture where none of the operators depend on time. Only thing that depends on time is the state represented by this coefficient function. So okay. the right-hand side of the Schrodinger equation is just given by time derivative of this coefficient function. What is lengthy algebra is to act this Hamiltonian on this state and commute all of these creation annihilation operators with each of these creation operators to make sure that you get all the terms you get from acting Hamiltonian on it. And that's a lengthy algebra, but it's straightforward. There's no ambiguity in doing so. And at the end of the mm -hmm. day, I get this right-hand side of this equation. So this Hamiltonian field theory ends up giving you this right-hand side of the equation, which is exactly the same thing as Hamiltonian in quantum mechanics would do on the wave function. So this is what I meant when I said you can derive quantum mechanics out of quantum yeah. field theory. So from the quantum field theory point of view, you don't care how many particles you got. You can always write down a state and then you can study it. But for each n particle state, you always can work out what the time evolution equation of this coefficient function capital of psi should be, which turns out to be exactly the same as the Schrodinger equation of multi-particle quantum mechanics of the fixed number of particles because the psi has the fixed number of arguments in it. But for each n, you correctly reproduce Hamiltonian for the number of particles you got for both kinetic and external potentials and number of pairs for the interactions you got. And then we didn't have to specify n in QFT. You do have to specify n in quantum mechanics, but you do get it correctly for arbitrary number of particles n from QFT, you can derive the quantum mechanical Schrodinger equation. So that's the statement I made. And does that make sense, yeah. Mashik? Excellent. Yeah. Also, it might be a little bit more asinine, but what's a Fox space? A Fox space is uh, uh, what we constructed some time ago. So if you start with this vacuum state, zero, yeah. you act a psi dagger on that state. So you have a collection of one particle states. You right. have two psi daggers on that state, that's collection of two particle state. And all of them live in the same Hilbert space now because you can go up and down in the number of particles using creation addition operators. So the collection of all those states living in the same Hilbert space is what is called the Fox space. Okay. So this is the union so of the vacuum state, one particle Hilbert space, two particle Hilbert space, three particle Hilbert space, dot, dot, dot. And all of them are part of this big Fox space. It's just a name, but that's, that is what it's called according to the name of physicist, uh, Fock. Uh, you know, I, I guess who lived in 30s or 40s, I don't know. <laughs> no worries. Thank you, Professor. I appreciate it. Okay. And you might have seen this word Hartree Fock equation when you studied, maybe have seen this discussion of multi electron atoms. And that's the same Fock, I believe. Any other questions on this point? I have um, okay, go ahead. Yeah, that's Asha. Who, who was it? Or maybe Natalie? I think, go ahead, was, Natalie. yeah, I had a question. Shirag had a question too, I think. Go ahead. Uh, my question was more technical and kind okay. of. Um, so the reason why we're doing the partial with respect to T and the Schroeder and Schrodinger equation here is because the Fox space is independent on time. That's right. So partial T derivative acts only on this capital psi because none of these operators depend on time. And that's not because of Fox space, by the way. That's because we are taking Schrodinger picture. So in the Schrodinger picture, states evolve in time, but operators don't, right? And if you right. go to Heisenberg picture, that's different. States do not evolve in time, but operators do. And it turns out that we later switch the, the Heisenberg picture when you introduce relativity, because we'd rather want these creation operators, namely field, to depend on space already, but also want to depend on time 
because we would like to treat space and time on equal footing once you have the relativity and the concept of space time. So once you have relativity, we want the operators, namely fields, to depend on time rather than states. So at that stage, we start to switch to the Heisenberg picture. But so far, we have been dealing with non-relativistic systems. So we don't need to treat space and time on an equal footing yet. So it's okay to treat the field operator depending only on space, but not on time, which is exactly what we do in the Schrodinger picture. That's why the only thing that depends on time here is this coefficient function that has the meaning of the state as a wave function of that state. And hence, t dependence is only here. Therefore, time derivative acts only on this coefficient function, nothing else on this state. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your okay. question, Adelie? Yeah. Okay, very good. And there was another student who wanted to ask a question. I heard a voice. Who was that? Yeah, it was me. Sure. Um, yeah, I was. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, like, how is the Fox space different from just a tensor product of Hilbert spaces? Uh, it's uh, actually direct sum of Hilbert spaces, if you would like to use that language. So the Hilbert space is no particle in it; it's one dimensional with this vacuum state only. Hilbert space with one particle is already in infinite dimensional that consists of psi lag of x acting on a vacuum state and x can be anywhere in space that's already infinite dimensional. And Hilbert space two particles with psi lag of x1, psi lag of x2 acting on a vacuum state that's infinite dimensional square. So each of the Hilbert space is defined by part of the specific number of particles. And you take the direct sum not the tensor product, but direct sum of all of these Hilbert spaces. And that's the Fox space. Does that answer your question, Shirag? Yeah, I just, for some reason, I thought when we did regular QM, um, we talked about multi-particle systems as being like a tensor product of Hilbert spaces. Yeah, yeah, so, so the product comes from the fact that you are taking product of creation operators. So when you go back to quantum mechanics, and think about two particle state. And you can consider two particle position eigenstates to be tensor product of first particle at position eigenstate x1 and second state particle in position eigenstate x2. And that is a tensor product. So here tensor product is now represented by literally product of two creation operators. So within this Hilbert space with two particles, you already have this tensor product structure in it. And if you go to three body uh, Hilbert space, that has a tensor product of first particle, second particle, and three particle, third particle in it. And then you take the grand sum of all these Hilbert spaces for an arbitrary number of particles. So that's the structure of the Fox space, if that answers your question, I hope. Does it? Yep, got it. So okay, it's good. Like the, uh, it's like the tensor algebra on a Hilbert space. Right, right. So if this language doesn't appeal to you, that's totally okay. So what we're talking about is the Fox space is the big Hilbert space in which we have subspaces of specific number of particles. And that's pretty much all important information there is here. Okay, so let me move on to the next slide. So let me ask the question, you might be still unhappy. So there are two puzzles you might wanna ask. Why does the Euler-Lagrange equation for the QFT look like single particle Schrodinger equation. Of course, resemblance is only a resemblance because the order Lagrange equation is nonlinear in the presence of the self-interaction, which clearly isn't Schrodinger equation. But at least the first two terms look like Schrodinger equation for a single particle. So where does this resemblance come from? That's one question you can ask. Another question you can ask is that, okay, we got this Hamiltonian, which was derived from the Lagrangian, but why did we have to accept that particular Lagrangian to start with? So when we are doing sort of bottom-up approach of building up the Lagrangian, you know where it started, and somehow you ended, you ended up with the Lagrangian for some reason. But if you want to take this top-down approach, you were given the Lagrangian, but then you would like to ask why. And so this part of the question becomes a little mathematical, I have to warn you, 
but there is actually a very clear answer to both of them. And let me just present this answer to you. So that is actually based on what is called the Galilean invariance of non-relativistic mechanics. So let me get to Galilean invariance, but I hope that these two questions are something you would resonate with, you would share with me. Uh, if there any uh, point that doesn't make sense about these questions, let me know. Is it okay? And sometimes questions make better sense once you know the answer. So maybe let me get to that. And again, we can always go back, come back to this slide. So it turns out that when you write the Lagrangian for a given system, the modern view of quantum field theory is that first thing you ask is what is the symmetry of the system? And once you have a symmetry, then mathematically, that gives you an idea called a group. So symmetry is, is always some transformation like rotation of space. And when you have rotation in three-dimensional space, you have rotation around the x-axis, you have rotation around the y-axis, you have rotation around the z-axis, you have three ways of doing rotation, or you can think about rotation around arbitrary axis. And you can do rotation successively I'm sure you have heard of this Euler angle idea. Any three-dimensional rotation can be always written as a product of three rotations around x-axis, y-axis, and again, an x-axis. So you can do rotations successively. So in this case, three times. So whenever you have two rotations that can be done successively, that corresponds to the multiplication of two rotations. And so that defines a product. When you have a rotation, you can also define the inverse rotation. So you have a inverse element and you can decide not to do rotation at all. That's the identity element. And these three properties are the axioms of the mathematics called the group theory. So whenever you think about symmetries, you can do symmetry transformation successively. And therefore, mathematically, you are always thinking about a group. And what you have to do then is to write down most general Lagrangian that is invariant under the symmetry you have in the system. And once you have this most general Lagrangian, then you count them up. And the only thing that's left is specify coefficient of each term of the Lagrangian you already got. And then that's the most general Lagrangian that you are allowed to write under a given symmetry. And then you start everything what we have done already, namely to quantize the Lagrangian. So you first define the canonical permutation relation, you derive the Hamiltonian, you identify the Hilbert space, then you start writing the Schrodinger equation for them, and then you get everything you need to recover everything you have done in quantum mechanics. So it turns out that in any case, you, the symmetry is the key. And for relativistic systems, obviously the symmetry is the Lorentz symmetry. For non-relativistic case, it's actually not quite Lorentz symmetry, but you still have this notion of the relativity a la Galileo, right? So if you have two spaceships like Dragon X, the, the Dragon spaceship uh, uh, launched by uh, SpaceX by uh, Elon Musk, and suppose you spaceships are passing each other, you know that which is a dumb question to ask which one is moving? Because you know everything is relative. The only thing that matters among these two spaceships is the physical question, namely that is the relative velocity. Absolute velocity doesn't make sense. Only relative velocity makes sense. There is no notion of absolute motion. So what that means is that you can always change your inertial frame where let's say one spaceship is at rest to another reference frame where the spaceship is moving with velocity v and changing from one reference frame to another reference frame is not supposed to change physics. It's just a ch change in description. And therefore your physical description should be invariant. It should not change when you go from one reference frame to another reference frame. And that is the idea of Galilean transformation, or sometimes also called Galilean boost. So the idea here is that once you have a good description of physical system, 
we have a symmetry. In this case, the symmetry is an invariance under this Galilean boost. Then your Lagrangian shouldn't change under the Galilean boost. And that tells you that you can't write an arbitrary Lagrangian. That's already restricted because it needs to satisfy this invariance. And how restrictive that is shows up on the next slide. But let me know if you have any questions about this idea that you have to require your Lagrangian has to be invariant under the symmetry you have in your system. And not just Galilean boost, of course, has to be invariant under rotation of the system. It has to be invariant under translation of the system. And that's the amount of symmetry you have in the Newtonian mechanics of non relativistic systems. Namely, you have three translations along x axis, y axis, z axis. You have three rotations around x axis, y axis, z axis. And then you also have three Galilean boosts along x direction, y direction, z direction. And finally, you also have an invariance of translation in time. So experiment you do at five in the morning and six in the evening should not give you different answers. And that's the invariance of the symmetry under translation in time. So you have actually quite a few number of symmetries you have to respect. And your Lagrangian has to be invariant under that. So that's the idea how symmetry would force certain particular short, uh, the, uh, the type of Lagrangian, but not others. So the, I hope this, the, the idea makes sense to you. So any questions are welcome. Is it okay? Well, if this idea is okay, now comes the technical thing. Namely that once you have a symmetry, you can ask your mathematician friend and they will tell you how the field operator should transform under the symmetry. Namely, if you define the Schrodinger field, which is the annihilation operator of particle at position X at time T, then changing from one reference frame to another reference frame would change Psi of XT to Psi prime or X prime and T prime. And under Galilean boost, time doesn't change. So T prime is the same as T, but position changes in a new reference frame. What used to be something at rest is now what is moving at velocity V. So X prime is X minus VT. And one funny thing is that you need to also put in this phase factor for the consistency. Consistency is given by the idea that if you do Galilean boost and do the translation later, that's actually not quite the same thing as doing translation and doing Galilean boost afterwards. And there is a difference in the phase of the field, which comes out in a consistent fashion. And I don't go into details here. I just would like to convey the idea how symmetry uh, works. And if you want to really know why this phase has to be there, then you are welcome to look at my lecture notes where Galilean invariance is discussed uh, in the, uh, 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 the lecture notes on classical uh, uh, the mechanics and also the, uh, the lecture notes on the, uh, the, the Schrodinger field. So I don't derive it here, but just accept this as a mathematical fact for now. So now comes the challenge. If Psi changes Psi prime, any combination that's written by Psi dag of Psi, the phase factor cancels. The only thing is X changes by X minus Vt. But then if we integrate over entire space X, then that just amounts to the shift in the integration dummy variable. So your Lagrangian doesn't change. So any term that can be written as one fact of psi and another fact of psi at the same location, which is the interaction term we had, we discussed before, is okay. Also this external potential term, which has one power of psi dagger and one power of psi at the same location. Again, these phase factors cancel, argument changes to x minus vt, but you do integrate by x, which is a dummy variable anyway. So you can shift the dummy variable integration by x to x plus vt, then nothing changes at the end of the day. So terms which don't derivatives then, always written as two factors of uh, the, uh, the psi 
a company website at, at the same location is invariant under the SCADI and boost automatically. So that's okay. But it does already give you a restriction. For example, if you want to write a term of psi dagger at y and psi of x at different locations, and that may not be okay, and so on and so forth. So the Galilean invariance already is restricting the form of the Lagrangian in a way that psi should always be accompanied by psi dagger at the same location because the phase factor depends on the location, you wanna make sure that phases cancel to make sure the Lagrangian is invariant. So that's where you already see the symmetry in action, namely that symmetry restricts the form of the Lagrangian you are allowed to write. And once you go to relativity, that restriction becomes even more severe because you have to treat space and time on equal footing. Now comes a challenge. I also want to write a term that involves time derivative and spatial derivative. But given that this phase factor has spatial dependence and time dependence, just acting derivative on it would give you additional terms where you bring in something out of the exponent and it doesn't become an invariant under the Gadidian boost. And spatial derivative will pull out MV time derivative would pull out mv squared. So you have to take some special combination of them to make sure that derivatives give you still invariant term in the Lagrangian. And you have to struggle a little bit. But the answer turns out to be this. There's only some combination derivative you are allowed to use, namely this combination of time derivative and spatial derivatives so that acting derivative on the field would still give you a transformation where phase factor can be put up front, namely that derivative changes by an overall phase, except for coordinate transformation, so that you can build an invariant out of it. And I'm not again showing the derivation here, you can consult the lecture note, but by taking this particular combination of derivatives, you are guaranteed that no matter how much Galilean transformation you do, it always boils down to a phase change. And this phase is the same as the change of phase of the field itself. So then you can write this term, Psi dagger, this capital D Psi, capital D Psi changes by this phase, Psi dagger, changes by the complex conjugate of this phase. So they cancel. And therefore this combination of Psi dagger capital D Psi is invariant, except that you shift the position, which is absorbed by the shift of the integration variable. So what do you learn is that derivative always need to come in this particular combination. And that's why we keep seeing this particular combination of time derivative and spatial derivatives. So this is imposed upon us because we like to make sure that our description of physics is Galilean invariant as it should be. That's the symmetry of the Newtonian space and time. And we would like to respect that. And then only this particular combination of derivatives is allowed. And that's what I meant on the two slides ago, namely modern view of QFT is you first identify what symmetries you have, then you know how the symmetries would transform the fields. Then you make sure that you write Lagrangian, which is invariant under the symmetry. Then what you can write in a Lagrangian is very much restricted. You can't write arbitrary derivatives on it. I can't write psi dagger time derivative psi that's not invariant. I can't write psi dagger spatial derivative psi, that's not invariant. I have to come up with this particular combination to make sure that it is invariant at the end of the day. So that's what I meant when I said symmetry restricts the form of the Lagrangian. And that, that's why we have rather specific combination of these derivatives. So here, I'm not telling you why this is the right transformation property. I'm not telling you why this is the right covariant derivative. 
so that it has the right transformation property. But once you accept this mathematical fact, then you know immediately that this is the only way you can write an invariant in the Lagrangian, which is respects the Galilean symmetry. So I hope that part of the argument is clear. So let me stop here. I'm sure you got some questions about this. Um, I had a question about the derivatives. Okay, Couldn't go ahead. we also um, have higher powers of D um, in yes. there? And it's there? Yes, you could. You could. But you know the rule in the Lagrangian formulation, namely the Lagrangian cannot have a term, which is the first, you can have the variables. You can have the first order in time derivative, but you are not supposed to have something with two derivatives in time and beyond. And that's actually a, uh, uh, the, the built into the Lagrangian formulation of mechanics and also field theory. So D already has one power in time derivative. So this already has one power in time derivative already. So what you could do is to add additional term, which is D psi dagger D psi. You could have that term. And so that's the field theory we are not discussing because it would lead to a different physics from what we wanted in terms of description of the non relativistic particles. But it turns out that that is the kind of term you do want when we move to relativistic quantum field theory. So you will see an example of that later on. So right now for non relativistic quantum physics, this is already sufficient for purpose. So that's why I'm not discussing another term that's possible by the symmetry, but I don't need it. But you could include it, and that would lead to a slightly different theory from just the pure non the quantum mechanics, and that's why I'm not discussing it. But from the point of view of writing the QFT, you are allowed to do so, and you can study what comes out of it. So that's an excellent question, and that's not what I'm doing in class, but that's something you could study on your own. And you will see an example of that when we get to relativity. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? Anyway, so that question really shows that you understood the concept. Once you're given symmetry, once you're given field, you try to write any terms that are allowed by the symmetry under the restriction of Lagrangian being always variable and type, single time derivative not, not beyond. And then you came up with another term you could write so you follow through this, basically the modern view of QFT as an algorithm. So you discover the new QFT we are not discussing in class, but that is an allowed QFT you should discuss, but for a different context. Excellent, I'm happy to hear that. Any other questions? Okay, so that's how we understand now the QFT top down. So this Lagrangian, is actually a special form of Lagrangian, which was designed to respect the Galilean symmetry in addition to rotation and translation in space and time. So this Lagrangian therefore is rather a special form of Lagrangian, but you have to start with this one because that's the basically the only Lagrangian you are allowed to write consistent with the Galilean symmetry. But also we know that one particle quantum mechanics has to be Galilean invariant too, in the absence of external potential. So no wonder one particle Schrodinger equation looks similar to Euler-Lagrange equation of the quantum field theory, which both of them respect Galilean invariance. And therefore the derivatives always come in this particular combination. So in the context of quantum mechanics, this basically looks like energy minus P squared over 2m, that's an allowed combination consistent with Galilean invariance. So from the compute theory point of view, you are writing a most general Lagrangian allowed by Galilean invariance. And therefore this combination of time derivative and spatial derivatives was forced on us. But also non the quantum mechanics needs to be invariant in the Galilean symmetry too. Hence the combination of E minus P squared over 2m so the resemblance we talked about was actually a consequence of the Galilean invariance. So I hope I answered the two questions 
I asked on two slides ago, actually four slides ago, the one of the question was, why is the resemblance between the Euler Lagrange equation for QFT to single particle Schrodinger equation in QM? And the answer turned out to be Galilean invariance. Both of them are supposed to be Galilean invariant, and that's why they looked similar, but certainly not identical because Euler Lagrange equation is nonlinear in general. Schrodinger equation has to be always linear, but they look similar because this derivatives come in this combination like e minus p squared over 2m. The second question, why did we have to take this Lagrangian? Again, was because of Galilean invariance. You just can't write arbitrary term in a Lagrangian. They have to respect the symmetry you have and that restricted the form on the QFT. So this actually turned out to be basically most general form. Apart from the second derivative, uh, one of you suggested, was it, uh, 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 who was it? Chirag? Asha, maybe? I don't know. I, I was talking about it. Uh, so, so, I'm sorry, who are you? I, it doesn't show the name. Oh, sure. Oh, okay. Great, thank you, Asha. So, so that is the second uh, answer to the second question. So I hope that will resolve potential unhappiness you might have had here. So Galilean invariance is actually playing a rather important role. So that finished up my discussion on how we make sure that quantum field that we build up from quantum mechanics led to the Lagrangian, which turned out to be automatically Galilean invariant because that was the physics we're dealing with. And this Galilean invariant QFT reproduces the end particle quantum mechanics, which is also Galilean invariant, by, of course, by construction. And that's why these two things exactly match up with each other. They have exactly the same physics content. But QFT is better in a sense that it has this big fox space where you get to choose the number of particles after the fact, not beforehand. You also have the symmetrization of the identical particles built in. You don't need to impose it by hand. So you really have these advantages. But in addition, the advantage we have in quantum field theory is that you can even talk about, this is a bizarre concept, linear combination of two particle state with three particle state. Now that sounds crazy. You know, when you see a system, you have a definite number of particles, right? But it does turn out in some cases like Bose-Einstein condensate of cold atoms, you do want to talk about linear superposition of states with different number of particles. And that's something impossible to do in quantum mechanics, because when you have a Hilbert space, Hilbert space has a definite number of particles in it. But in QFT, your big Fox space contains Hilbert subspaces with different number of particles for each, and you can even consider linear combination of those states with different number of particles because they live in the same big Fox space. And that sounds, I'm sure, very crazy and bizarre to you right now, but I'd like to talk about how that kind of situation is experimentally realized. And then we really need to embrace that kind of formulation to describe physics we study in the lab. And there QFT becomes essential because that description is impossible in quantum mechanics, but becomes possible in QFT. So that's the idea I'd like to talk about now, namely Bose-Einstein condensate. And it turns out that once you talk about Bose-Einstein condensate, which is a highly quantum state of matter, for some reason, that ends up being a classical field theory. And this is once again, this amazing idea of wave particle duality in quantum physics comes out. If you start with the particle, wave is quantum. If you start with field, particle is quantum. And what we're talking about here is that when you talk about this highly quantum state of atoms with large number of particles in it, it turns out that that can be described by a classical field. And that is actually the classical limit of the Schrodinger quantum field theory. So that's the idea I'd like to convey now. And I'm sure that sounds totally bizarre for now, but hopefully you will start making sense 
as we move, move, go on. Professor, I have a quick question about the okay, previous slide. Uh, okay, go ahead. Can you go back to the Lagrangian? Um, okay. Thanks. Uh, so um, I understand once you have a derivative, you're kind of forced to use this like IH bar, uh, side dagger, side dot, and that mm -hmm. gives you the commutation relation because you know it's right. Lagrangian. Right. Uh, and then, so you know it's the annihilation and creation operators. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, at that point, then can you decide the coefficients like V of X and this lambda over two give you the potential interaction? Because isn't there no way of knowing that before you know that there are a creation, uh, uh, that it's a creation and an annihilation operator? Or can you, before you even um, write down any commutation relation, can you put these coefficients in and know what they are? Um, well, so in some sense, we anticipated this canonical quantization condition when we put H IH bar factor so that I can cancel later on. So if you're just starting and to write down the QFT uh, from top-down approach by res respecting all the symmetries you got, you probably wouldn't put IH bar in here as, as a beginning. You still mm -hmm. need to put I there to make sure that this is a Hermitian. When you take Hermitian conjugate, time derivative is now daggered. You use integration with parts that act on the other side. So you have a sign flip. Compensated for the sign flip, you do need I for sure. So that's something you know. But you probably wouldn't put H bar in here. So that's where, why I briefly talked about this idea that you can in principle absorb this fact of psi bar into the normalization of psi and pretend that is the classical field theory where psi bar no, uh, doesn't appear anywhere in the Lagrangian. So that is probably where you would like to start with. But when you actually start to quantize it, you quickly realize that psi psi dagger commutator has an IH bar in it and it becomes cumbersome to keep writing H bar every time. So then you'd rather put H bar in here by changing the normalization of psi so that psi psi dagger commutator does look like just the annihilation creation operators. So that's something you would know after the fact. Does that answer your question, okay. Adi? Okay, that, yeah, that's an excellent question. Once you know, and then once you know that, then you know that like V of X is actually the potential and then lambda over two is actually interaction term, right? That's right, that's correct. So if you didn't know that beforehand, then this H bar isn't there, and this might actually have extra H bar in it. So, so your H bar counting will be totally, in some sense, wrong after the fact. But because we sort of know the answer ahead of time, I, I, I know I'm supposed to put H bar here, I'm supposed to put two powers of H bar there, and that will produce this the correct Schrodinger equation once you I reproduce quantum mechanics. So putting H bar here anticipates what we get. Uh, by reproducing the multi-particle quantum mechanics, but you wouldn't know that ahead of the time. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Any other questions, by the way, here? Um, I have a question, not about this, but about what you said about the Fox space. So, oh, oh um, Fox space. Okay. If yeah, so if you have like a a general superposition over a general superposition state in your fog space, does that mean that when you measure it, it can collapse to any number of particles? That's right. So if we have superposition of states uh, with different number of particles in it, and just like any other observable in quantum mechanics, once you measure it, it collapses to an eigenstate of the observable you measured. So in this case, that would become an eigenstate of the number operator. So that's exactly right. And what I'm going to talk about uh, hopefully soon is that that's exactly what we actually uh, observe in the uh, uh, Bose-Einstein condensate. So, so let me actually get to that now. Okay, so we have been talking about this Lagrangian, and we always quantized it and got the Hilbert space of multi-particle states. So. We think now we understand the quantum theory of this Lagrangian pretty well. But when you had quantum mechanics, of course you can quantize it and get the Schrodinger equation like harmonic oscillator, you do understand well there, but we also had the classical limit of it that was just the classical pendulum. So once you have a quantum system, you can talk about its classical limit. And in the case of quantum mechanics, it always leads to sort of familiar mechanics of particles a la Newton and so that is how the classical limit actually works. 
But in the case of this quantum field theory, we so far dealt with quantum field theory, but not with its classical limit of classical field theory. And in classical field theory, just like in classical mechanics, all you care about is solving the equation of motion. So in quantum mechanics, you have to solve for the states and the energy eigenvalues and so on and so forth. But in classical mechanics, the only, only thing you care about is how things move as a function of time. And P and Q can be determined simultaneously, infinitely accurately. And that's the solution to the equation of motion. That's all you care about. So when you think about classical limit of the quantum field theory we built, you, are, you wouldn't like to solve the classical equation of motion, namely uh, the, 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 the Euler-Lagrange equation. So let us look at this field theory in a very simple situation where this potential energy term is just a constant, which is the chemical potential if you study uh, thermodynamics or statistical mechanics. So this is the energy cost per particle, and that's the chemical potential. And the Euler-Lagrange equation for this field theory is given by this. As I emphasized, this is a nonlinear equation. So in general, this is actually hard to solve. But there are situations where you can find exact solutions to this. And one of the solution is really trivial. Namely, psi just identically vanishes. When you plug it in there, every term in the order Lagrange equation vanishes. So it is satisfied. So it's kind of a, a boring solution. But anyway, it's a solution to the order Lagrange equation. So what does it mean? Another solution, approximate solution you can come up with is that when psi squared is much smaller than mu over lambda, you can check that this term, the last nonlinear term, is quite negligible compared to the other terms in the Euler-Lagrange equation. And once you neglect this nonlinear term, then this becomes a linear equation. And linear differential equation is something you know how to solve. And you can find this plane wave solution. But this is an approximate solution. So when you care about the system with interaction in it, then this is definitely not an exact solution. The only exact solution we could find so far is this trivial one where psi vanishes. So what does it mean? Well, so this is actually a classical solution to the Euler-Lagrange equation. If you remember, that corresponds to basically harmonic oscillator because psi is an annihilation operator. And in classical mechanics, field moves in circle. And that corresponds to this plane wave solution, which is only approximate. But this is a solution where real part of imaginary part goes around and around as a function of time, because e to the minus i omega t is cosine omega t minus i sine omega t. So real part of imaginary part goes around and around. So that's the classical motion here. In particular, this trivial solution, psi vanishing identically, is a pendulum sitting at rest. And what it means from the field theory language, once you compare to the quantum mechanics, is that psi going around and around definitely corresponds to number eigenstate with fixed energy. Psi sitting around at origin is the ground state, which is not excited, the lowest energy state. So intuition of these special solutions we found with a positive chemical, negative chemical potential where potential is positive, is actually a, this kind of number eigenstates uh, in the classical limit. So what we have discovered, that number eigenstate in harmonic oscillator uh, is actually this round and round motion. And that is what is represented by these solutions in classical field. But you have to make sure that mu minus mu is positive in order to find these solutions, as you will see what changes when I change the sign of mu. But anyway, so this is just a classical solution to the field equation of motion. And that leads to these rather trivial solutions, which corresponds to psi going around and around in circle, which correspond to classical pendulum uh, of the particle mechanics. And that's indeed sort of a trivial idea of psi uh, being a classical solution. 
So, so far, this is not very non-trivial. And, but anyway, that's how the classical limit of psi actually comes out from equation of motion. So any questions about this? Next thing obviously is switch the sign of mu and go to positive mu or negative potential. Then you find something actually quite non-trivial and that's actually what corresponds to both Einstein and condensate. Anyway, I'm, I'm pausing here. Any questions about this? It looks like there's none. So you will see why I'm discussing this because now I'd like to talk about the other sign of mu. So suppose mu is positive, then potential V is negative. And this is the Euler Lagrange equation now with positive mu. Now you find a different situation of the meaning of this chemical potential positive mu namely that if you add one more particle to the system, you gain energy rather than it costs you energy. So this is the way you would like to build a system with large number of particles in it because you would like to put more particles in the system so that you can gain energy. And that's particular in the case when you have this repulsive potential, when you have repulsive interaction among particles, then particles want to be as far away from each other as possible. When you would like to build a system where particles are closely bunched together, which is the idea of both Einstein condensate, you put in this positive chemical potential that the system wants to have more particles in it despite the repulsing force. And that's why we now take the opposite sign of the positive chemical potential. So you like to compete against the repulsive force that's why you put the positive chemical potential so that system wants to have more particles in it. Once again, the, this field equation of motion is nonlinear. So you can solve this equation in general, but once again, there is a special cases where you can solve, just like cycle zero solution you had before, which you do have once again, but now you have a different solution. Even when psi is independent of time and space, that I can drop these derivative terms, I can satisfy this equation by balancing these two terms where psi squared has a value of mu over lambda. You can solve this equation and when psi is non-zero, you can factor psi out from both these large terms, then negative mu plus lambda psi dagger psi is zero. And the solution is this one. Right? And this is a solution you didn't have before. When mu was negative, this could have never been satisfied because the left hand side is psi absolute squared, that's positive definite. But mu over lambda for negative mu is negative definite. You can never satisfy this equation. But now that we are talking about positive mu, you can satisfy this equation. Then you find that you find a not an infinite number of solutions to the system. So I have one solution where psi vanishes. I have infinite number of solutions where psi can take an arbitrary phase. So that's why you have infinite number of them, which can be understood by this picture. So by looking at this term with mu psi dag up psi, and this term with lambda over two psi dag up psi dag up psi psi, I can plot this on the plane of psi, real part of psi, imaginary part of psi as a horizontal plane. And the vertical axis is the size of these two terms, minus mu psi dagger psi plus lambda two psi dagger psi psi psi, namely this function over here. And this function depends only on the modulus of psi, namely psi dagger psi, because we made sure that it's Galilean invariant. And from the origin, it goes down first because of this negative mu. So origin is actually not a minimum, but local maximum. It starts to go down. But one psi becomes big enough, the quadratic term always wins over the quadratic term. This lambda is positive for repulsive interaction, starts to go up quadratically. So here's the potential. It goes down quadratically and goes up quadratically. 
But because it depends only on the modulus of psi, the phase doesn't matter. And the phase is this angular direction on complex plane between real part and imaginary part. So this potential is symmetric under the rotation around the vertical axis. That's why this term here in the Hamiltonian is depicted by this picture here. And when you drop a ball on this potential, suppose you drop a ball aiming at this origin where Psi vanishes, it comes here, but clearly it doesn't stay there. It's unstable. And it decides to fall down into one of the directions. And we can't tell which direction it falls because every direction is identical. Physics is invariant under the rotation around this axis. But when the system picks the minimum, it has to pick a particular phase. So the symmetry of rotating around this Z axis is now broken because system needs to choose a particular phase. And this is a concept called spontaneous symmetry breaking. Symmetry is there. Lagrangian is invariant under changing the phase of psi, that's a rotation around the Z axis. This system has that symmetry. But the lowest energy configuration of the field, which of course corresponds to the ground state of the quantum system, picks a particular phase, and therefore the ground state does not respect the symmetry anymore. Hence, symmetry break, breaking. But symmetry is not violation of the symmetry. And that's why we say this is a spontaneous symmetry breaking, because when you drop the ball, you can tell which direction the ball would force into. But the ball decides to fall into a point one particular direction spontaneously on its own, basically by an accident. And that's why we say this motion of a ball dropping into one particular direction is a spontaneous symmetry breaking. And here, this name doesn't really matter for now. I will come back to talk about this later again because it turns out to be rather general concept in physics. But right now, here we're only looking at a one particular example of it. So we do find this non-trivial solution where Psi doesn't vanish this time because the chemical potential is positive. That's a solution we didn't have before for the negative chemical potential. And once you have a solution, because the system is Galilean invariant, I can obtain another solution by performing a Galilean transformation on it. And then you find this solution, you can plug this into this equation of motion and verify that it satisfies the equation of motion. And given that Psi is now the Galilean transform of this one, the solution explicitly looks like this. So I plug in this expression for the Galilean transformation of an arbitrary solution. But here I'm picking a particular solution given by this. Then you put it in here, then the solution after Galilean transformation looks like this. And you can sort of check by your eyes that this satisfied this field equation because time derivative will pull out half mv squared. Spatial derivative will pull out mv for each derivative. So here you get mv squared. One factor of m is canceled. Then you get mv, m, mv squared over two. That cancels mv squared over two from time derivative. So these two terms balance against each other. And these two terms still balance against each other because once you take the absolute square of psi, that's still mu over lambda. So these two terms cancel, these two terms cancel. Therefore, this is a solution to the field equation. So positive mu case is a lot more interesting. You find now a general space in time dependent solution to the field equation, which we didn't have before. And we know psi dag of psi has a meaning of number density. So this square root mu over lambda factor should have the meaning of the square root of number density as a solution to this nonlinear field equation. 
Again, this is not Schrodinger equation because it's nonlinear. And we actually rely on this nonlinear property to find this minimum with non-zero potential. I cannot take lambda to zero to recover a linear equation, then psi would run off to infinity, which makes sense because if you turn off this quadratic positive potential, then you only have negative quadratic potential. The ball keeps rolling down the hill. System doesn't have a ground state anymore. So this ground state exists only because of the finite lambda. And because of nonlinearity, that's definite, definitely different from a solution to shortening equation. But it turns out that this classical solution to the field theory actually describes this highly quantum state of matter, namely Bose Einstein condensate. And that would come up later. But anyway, so far, we are only doing just solving the classical field equation. And we didn't see the purpose of doing so yet. It would come later. But when mu is positive, at least you do find these non-trivial solutions. And non-trivial solutions exist because of this quadratic nonlinear potential. And also there are infinite number of nonlinear solutions because the phase is arbitrary. And you can even more infinite number of solutions by going to arbitrary reference frame where this psi is now a function of space and time. So at least you agree that this is now a solution to the field equation we have. Okay, let me pause here and see if we have any questions. And again, this actually field equation becomes the next homework problem. So you actually solve this field equation yourself, convince yourself that these are indeed solutions to this nonlinear field equation. What that means is, is we have to come, but uh, you will see that this is a solution. But anyway, any more questions about this? Chirag? So under the, yeah, under the Galilean transformation section, um, yeah. why is there not an arbitrary phase factor tacton? Um, uh, so th this phase factor always canceled because you always have one psi and white psi and dagger in every term in the Lagrangian. So that's why Galilean invariance was invariance of the Lagrangian. But what we say here is the Galilean covariance of the solution. You have solution in one reference frame. And because the Lagrangian is invariant, if you go to a different reference frame, the solution would give you another solution in a different reference frame. They are now different solutions to the same equation of motion, but you are guaranteed that one solution in reference frame, reference frame would transform to another solution in another reference frame. Namely two SpaceX rockets passing each other. You, this is one solution in one reference frame, say, but you're welcome to go to another reference frame where one rocket is at rest, the other rocket is speeding fast. Or you can also go to another reference frame where second rocket is wet, and the first rocket is uh, 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 speeding fast. All of them are the solution to the equation of motion. You are guaranteed <coughs> that this is a solution to the equation of motion in any reference frame because Newtonian equation of motion is Galilean invariant. <coughs> so it's the same idea. Does that answer the question, Shira? What I was, yeah, okay, well, I, I guess what I was asking is like, um, wouldn't a more general solution to be to also have an e to the i theta along mm -hmm. with the um, Galilean invariant? Ah, ah, that's right. Yeah, sorry, sorry. So here I drop e to the i theta for the simplicity of the expression, but you could have still put e to the i theta here. Then you do have infinite number of solutions in that reference frame as well. So sorry, I, I misunderstood your question, but you're completely right. And that's a valid question to ask. So thank you for asking that. Any other questions about these uh, uh, solutions? I have a question. Is it okay, possible to measure um, the relative phase of that like Galilean phase? That's an, that's an excellent question. So absolute phase, you can never measure it, but relative phase you can. And indeed using this solution, you can find a interference pattern. So that's an excellent question. And just to, show, uh, just to actually give you a little bit of appetite on what's coming next, let me show this one video and then stop there for the uh, end of my class today. Can you hear the sound? So you start with a system of just a bunch of atoms at a gas at a high temperature. 
And that's a situation where you have negative chemical potential. Because at high temperature, the casting energy to have a particle is totally okay. But then you start to lowering the temperature, then the state starts to become slow. Slow means low momentum, and inverse momentum is the wavelength. So each atom has to have such a low to grow E wavelength. And at some point, they start to overlap with each other. And all of these collection of individual atoms turn into a single wave. That's the phase transition. And collection of macroscopic number of atoms, like a thousands and millions of them, start to behave like a single classical wave, which shows the interference pattern, just like what Cameron asked. And that's the idea of both Einstein condensate. And that is, it turns out, what you can describe by this classical solution to the field equation of the Schrodinger theory. And that's why classical limit actually does describe a physical system. So this is, again, this particle wave duality. And it always goes the other way around. When you start with particles, then this Bose-Einstein condensate is a highly quantum state of matter. And we don't even know how to describe it because you're talking about this macroscopic number of particles in it. But in field theory, you start with a field instead. And when you quantize it, you get particles out. But if you go back to classical limit of the field theory, that ends up describing this Bose-Einstein condensate, which is a highly quantum state of particles. So very quantum state of particles is the very classical state of field and vice versa. And that's the sort of the opposite behavior of a particle in field you see in this description. So what we're gonna talk about on Friday is get more into this idea of Bose-Einstein condensate, what these solutions actually do and how we can even observe the interference pattern and what is going on with this crazy superposition of the states with different number of particles going on. So these are the things that is coming up on Friday. So I hope I uh, whet your appetite sufficiently that you will come to class. And so I uh, stop here and uh, uh, any questions. Um, I guess going back to the interference question. Uh, so okay. I was thinking like, at least with the relative phase, like wouldn't it be based on the different speeds of like, let's say bosons interacting with each other, mm -hmm. like having a composite wave function and, and then that would develop the relative phase, not necessarily based on the fact that they're all on the same ground state. Yeah, so this is actually an experimental observation of the interference pattern between two Bose-Einstein condensates. So you create one Bose-Einstein condensate and you uh, uh, create it in a, in, in a trap, uh, in this case, a magnetic trapping using laser. You create another condensate and you just let both of them drop by turning off the laser and they keep going down and eventually start to overlap. And that's when you start to see the fringe patterns. And these two condensates have slightly different velocities because they are dropping in sort of a close to each other. So they have different velocities and therefore V is different in the solution we talked about. And that's why you see the phase difference between the two and hence the fringe pattern. So we will talk about that on Friday. Okay, any other questions? Okay, good. So I stop here. And so the idea is that you really would like to see this particle wave duality in, in full action. And that's why we are taking this classical limit of the Schrodinger field, which turns out to be this BEC of cold atoms. And we try to understand a bit more details about what's going on there on Friday. Okay, see you then. Thank you. And make sure you make use of the discussion section tomorrow. Bye. Bye.